My guest is Paul Theroux, a travel writer and novelist. I think the number's at 52 in terms of novels, uh, many travel books as well. Uh, he's the father of British authors and documentary filmmakers, Marcel and Louis Theroux, and uncle of the American actor, Justin Theroux and screenwriter, who I th my understanding is going to be starring in a remake of one of Paul's books, Mosquito Coast, coming up soon. Uh, his new book is Under the Wave at Waimea, his new novel, and I'm just reading from the jacket. It's about big wave surfer Joe Sharkey, past his prime and is losing his stroke, and he gets involved in uh, an accident that leads to interesting consequences and uh, I think a changed relationship with his his partner, Olive. Um, and I wanted to, I was looking at your background, Paul, and I'm from Buffalo, New York, one of five Catholic family. You are from Medford, Massachusetts, the third of seven and the son of Catholic parents, if, I, if I'm wrong. How much does that that background affect what you write about and how you write? A lot. If, if no one's ever asked me that question <laughs> because no one comes from big families anymore. So um, the answer is a lot, a lot. If you come from a big family, as you do, as I do, you learn a lot about yourself, a lot about negotiation, and you learn to you learn how to fit in. You learn how to fit in. The only way to become a writer in a large family is to leave the family. But you leave the family because you, there's no way that you can succeed in almost anything in my experience, in a big family, that, that you, have to, you have to separate yourself because there's just too many people around. There's too many people asking questions, teasing, mocking, I don't know, uh, rivals. You might get some support for one or two, but others will be your rivals. It's, it, it's a, a family is a nation. It's a, it's a tribe. It has certain rules, a certain language. And I learned a lot. But I also discovered that I really had to go away to become a writer. So you say, how did it help me become a writer? It helped me become a writer by, I suppose, observing other people, being very watchful. No one in a big family takes anything for granted. You don't take it in the family. You don't, you don't, don't assume that's my chair. I'm going to take the last cookie on the plate. Uh, I'm hungry. I can't do that. You need to pitch in, you need to cooperate, and you need to, to watch your back, of course. But um, so it made me a traveler. It made me a great traveler because I learned how to get along with other people. And I learned to get along with a lot of hostility um, in, a, in a big family. You're asking a very, very big question when you're, when you're talking about a big family, but I can say that um, I really pondered this for many, many years. When I went to Africa in 1963, I left home four years before that. I went to college. And when I went to college, I was basically, I guess I was 17 or 18. I separated myself from the family. I went away. I was a, um, a uh, you know, I, 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 I went away to school. I was in a dormitory. And, uh, and I went home and someone had my bedroom. So, I mean, I, I had to, there's a lot of sharing in a family. But I started to say, when I went to Africa, I was very able. I mean, I had a lot of skills um, that I was able to use in a, in, a, in a village. First, I understood the nature of a tribal society because I come from a big family. There were, the other was, I, I knew how to, to deal with other people, particularly where there's a, a low level of hostility or doubt or, or suspicion. So I, I was in a Peace Corps group one of the first Peace Corps groups to go to Nyasaland, which became Malawi. And the, uh, the volunteers who were only children and only child really had a tough time. They really hadn't, they hadn't dealt with a lot of other people. It wasn't that they were autistic or anything like that. It's just that they, they didn't realize that you, 
you need to give something. You can't, you can't make any assumptions. No one in a big family makes assumptions. It wasn't until, so, so that, that helped me a lot. No one supported me to be a writer. No one in the family said, I didn't even, I mean, I suggested that I want to be a writer and, and I got a kind of frowning silence. So through my early life, I said I wanted to be a doctor. Being a doctor, that's a respectable thing to do. And I, I even was a pre-med student. But it wasn't until I was in my 70s that I began to look closely at the family and realized the thing that I hadn't done that a lot of writers do is write about their family. That's usually the first book. It's their first experience. So Thomas Mann wrote Budenbrooks. Many other people have written about them. They're, they're, that's the first thing, that's the first experience. Mom, dad, whatever. I didn't do that. Um, I wrote a, a novel, Motherland. Um, it came out in 2017 after my mother died. My mother um, died four days before her 104th birthday. That's a blessing that she lived so long, but it was also very inconvenient. I, I really didn't want to write about her or the family while she was alive. I didn't want to break her heart or hold a mirror up. Uh, my mother was a very a hypersensitive person, but I published the book. So anyone interested in a big family, you come from one, uh, should read that book, Motherland. So you're saying, how did it affect you as a writer? First, made me watchful, made me negotiate, uh, made me look for a refuge. My refuge was the library, it wasn't home. Or well, when I was home, I had a book. Uh, you, you don't have a lot of privacy in a big family. So it made me a reader. Reading made me a traveler, made me a writer, or acquainted me with writing. So in, in many negative ways, it helped me. And, and then I went away. Now, after I published the book, Motherland, my family stopped speaking to me. But, mm -hmm. And people said, was well, that terrible? Well, they hadn't been that friendly before. So <laughs> I'm on, I'm not on terrible terms with them. They just, they re but they had sort of rejected me before because they're very competitive. Also, you say, um, my kids are writers. I, I have three brothers who are writers. Alex, who's a novelist, Alexander Theroux. Joseph, who writes uh, uh, travel and, and uh, novels. I mean, he self-publishes some book, but I mean, he's writer. Peter, who was in a, a government, has written a book about the Middle East, a book about LA, and he's working on another book. So there's three of them, right? You come from family. So there's four of us who are writers. And then the other brother who's not a writer is a lawyer. I mean, put all those people together. Then I have two sisters. And so, you know, it's quite, it's quite a bucket of crabs crawling over each other. And I think, um, as I said, I'm not used to that, this, this question, but it, 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 it's an amazing, it's an amazing study. It's in, and I, I could go on much longer, but I don't want to. I, I'd be interested in your family and, and, and how it worked out. And you, where do you come in that order? I'm the second of five. There were actually six and one died as a baby uh, and which dramatically affected my mother uh, for the rest of her Wait, life. Just I, interrupt by saying, yeah. The exact things happened in my family. My mother uh, uh, lost a, a, a baby and never forgot it and mourned the death of that child until she died. And in the book, I say, the book starts, there were nine of us and one of us was dead. Yeah, it was always there. Mary Michelle, she would cross her, she would do the, the a cross uh, every time she saw an ambulance and would have to have a cry because it made her remember that. Um, but I was really struck. It's interesting that you say that, you know, you were able to learn how to negotiate and you were able to read people because you do, you have to maneuver, you have to hustle, you have to take bully, being bullied, being criticized. Uh, there's a lot of that. And I wonder if you wouldn't, I was really struck in your book by the sensitivity in one scene in particular throughout your book. Um, but I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading at the bottom of page 96, uh, the carryover paragraph that then goes to the, the, the standalone paragraph on 2097, starting with the word olive. Um, so it starts desperate. Oh, oh. I, I, her, it, it starts, I'm desperate. It says I'm desperate, gonna, she said. 
Hopefully we have the same version, the bottom of 96. Yeah, 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 I have it. Desperate, she said. Don't you understand that? Yes. Mm -hmm. well, I wonder if you could read it out loud. Sure. Desperate, she said. Don't you understand? I just lost a baby in the surf at Leftovers. Leftovers is a break in on the North Shore, a surf break. I just lost a baby in the surf at Leftovers while you were pulling me to shore. I'm not blaming you. But the wave seemed a mile away and maybe I started losing it as I paddled out. But you don't remember that. You don't remember anything. I think it was an omen like all the other omens that nothing in our lives would go right. Nothing has gone right since the day of the accident. It's been one bloody thing after another. Nothing has been normal. You were acting strange. I tried to get away. I discovered I was pregnant. You seemed happy about it. And then, wouldn't you know, I lost the baby and all that surf. And my nausea has gone away. I'm sleeping better. I have no cramps. I've recovered my health. I'm seeing things clearly. And here her voice broke. I'm desperate. If you could Sharky do the next listen. two, yeah. Sharky listened to this without an expression. Though it seemed to her that he had a fixed look of mild impatience, as though listening to her speaking was just a question of waiting for her to finish, not objecting to anything she said. Because a short while... In a short while, she'd be exhausted and done, delivered of her complaint. Then they could go on, eat something, smoke a joint, go to bed early. And with this in mind, he yawned. Olive was breathing hard. Her rant had made her head ring. Yeah, there's... Doctor squinted at her and said, the accident, what about it? You remember it? Do you like one? Or... Yeah, no, I, I wanted to ask just about that part. Um, I was so struck by how much was going on there, where... She was grieving, but then her nausea had gone away. She was sleeping better. So she was so conflicted and he was just checked out. Um, and so when I first saw this book, I said, maybe this is since you've lived in Hawaii for 30 years and on the water your whole life or much, much of your life, maybe this is Joe Sharkey as a piece of Paul Theroux in it. But then when I hear about your family, and the ability to write that, the nuances of that couple, so much baked into those two paragraphs, I said, maybe this Joe Sharkey isn't, isn't really Paul. I'm wondering, where does that come from, that, that ability to capture the nuances of so many narratives in those few short paragraphs in this complicated relationship? I, I think... Um, it, it's it, it's not to do with the big family, although I may say um, in a big family, you take nothing for granted. And, and if someone's in pain, you notice it. I also want to say about a big family is you help with the dishes, you clear the table. The, the child who comes from a, uh, the only child leaves his plate on the table and walks away. The mother takes it away because he's the only child, he's a, or she, little princess, little prince. They're gonna, if I left a, a dish on the table, I'd get yelled at. Move your dish, help with the dishes. You help, you pitch in. It's a great training, actually, a big family. So that's a, we could do another program on big families. You asked why, um, the, 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 about the reactions in this. This book is about a man who hits someone with his car. When he's asked about it later, he said, I hit a drunk homeless guy. All of the girlfriend says, no, you didn't. You killed a man. You killed a man. And he said, well, well yeah. I and then she says, but who was it? We don't know. Then bad things start happening to him. And among them, it's not maybe related to uh, uh, the death of the man. She loses a child. He almost drowns. Strange things happen. Pretty soon, at the end of the first part of the book, you think, this man is, has got a big problem. And so it's that that wasn't um, a big family thing or reading into it, but I, I was trying to get into the into the um, into the consciousness or lack of it of someone who's lost all curiosity about why this has happened. And as a matter of fact, the person <laughs> that the the the. the uh, motivation for this book, the, the germ of this book, came when a guy uh, that I know um, 
couldn't put we were supposed to meet he couldn't pick me up i saw him i was on my bike and i saw his car was damaged and um i said what what happened he said yeah i hit a drunk homeless guy i said oh, really who was it he said i don't know i don't know i said what happened to the guy he said he died he said it in hawaii maki he went maki he's dead i said really he said yeah he said you know what surf's up let's you know let's it didn't occur to him but here's the thing which is interesting he's an only child i knew his mother he's an only child and he has that narcissism of the only child so that anyway he's not a bad guy i mean he just just didn't occur to him it, it was a rainy night he hit a the guy was going on the wrong side of the road as many cyclists do he hit the guy totaled his car, uh, the man died. And I've never, I, I never revisited that, but I thought, well, what if that happened? I'm just extrapolating that because this is how novels, this is how a germ of a novel happens. I thought about it and thought about it. And I thought, well, what happened? What, supposing um, there, were no, there was an effect of that. I mean, he internalized it and things start going wrong in his life. Supposing also that the man he killed was someone uh, uh, not just a drunk homeless guy, but someone who had had some bad luck and had a life. And what about a life? It's a human being. It's a guy who happened to be a middle-aged guy. What about the 45 or 50 years of his life? You know, wh what about all that? Do you just shovel that into a hole? So I use that as the angle for the, to, for the book. And the first part of the book I wrote, um, about a man, about this guy, Joe Sharkey, who's a champion surfer, but he's an older guy, he's in his 60s, many surfers are, and he's a somewhat forgotten figure to the young people who are the, you know, the hot shots. And so aging surfer, but he's had his day, but he still wants to do it. That's something I can relate, as a writer, I can relate to that. I mean, all older writers think, um, what about me? They say, someone says, well, there's this hot new writer, and you think, well, what about me? I, I'm, a, I'm a good writer. Or a surfer would say, they'd say, hey, do, how about so-and-so with surfing pipeline? He's great. Huh? And, and he'd say, yeah, he's great. And he'd also think, well, I had a good ride today. You know, I'm, what about me? <laughs> it's not narcissistic to think that. You just think, well, I have a life, you know, and I'm a surfer, and I'm, I'm a writer, you know. <laughs> I didn't, where's my MacArthur grant? So, the, I, I, and up to that point where, things go completely wrong in his life, including the death of Olive's, or, or, or the, 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 the uh, miscarriage that she has, then I, I, I left it at that. And, um, and then I thought I had to think more about it. So is that how it, is that how these stories evolve for you where something happens and then you spin out, spin out a longer narrative and then fill it in? I'm just fascinated with, how do you come up with the story for a novel? I wrote my my honor thesis at Cornell University on Flannery O'Connor and wrote, and oh, wrote all great. her writings. And she said, "Listen, you can't teach writing." Uh, Ernest Hemingway also can't can't teach anyone to be a fiction writer. Do you agree with that? I mean, have you yeah, got I said I I said that I, I I wrote a piece for the New Yorker that was in the it's on the website now. Uh, it's it's about my big birthday, which happened last week. And I said in the piece, I'm, I know I'm not welcome in any English department um, because I don't believe that fiction writing can be taught. But early in my life, earlier in my life, I, I lived in Africa for quite a long time and I met V.S. Naipaul, the writer V.S. Naipaul, who later won the Nobel Prize. And I, uh, he's a wonderful writer, not a popular writer, uh, but a, 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 a brilliant man probably bipolar, he's very difficult at times. I wrote a book about him called Servidia's Shadow. But when I met him, and this is also related to family, uh, if someone in my family said, I know you're gonna be a, a great writer, um, I know you're gonna be a writer and uh, you've got a lot to write and I'm gonna be watching your career. I would have thought, you know, this is not helping me. I, I don't, uh, how is it, a member of my family what do they know about writing? How are they? How is that going to be sport? But I met this this guy, um, uh, 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 Naipaul, V.S. Naipaul, uh, 
And this was in Uganda. And he said, we got along. I had read all his books. I knew he was coming. He was going to be the writer in residence. And he read stuff that I wrote. And he said, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. And I took that as encouragement, and it was. And I was friendly with him for 30 years. Then we fell out. He, his wife died. He remarried. The new wife kind of swept me away. Then we got friendly again later. But that's another story. But the thing is, no, you can't teach writing. I don't believe you can. Hemingway's right. Flannery O'Connor is right. Neither of them went to, uh, um, uh, got a master in creative writing or anything like that. But what you need, what I had, is encouragement and encouragement from the right person. And this is another reason to leave a big family or to, to get away. You're always in a, in a big family, you're not supported. Or if you are supported, you don't really trust the person. What you need as a beginning writer is someone to say, yes, you have it. That's good. I'm going to help you. Or, you know, um, well, as Naipaul used to constantly said to me, you're going to be all right. So you used to say, try not to make a, a lot of money before you're 40, you know, earn it after you're 40. Don't, don't have a big success before. He was always talking about money, but I had encouragement. So I would say that although, and I said in the piece in the New Yorker, although I don't believe that writing can be taught, um, you can make suggestions, you can read things and so forth, but you can't tell, you can't intensify a person's imagination, which is everything to do with writing. But you can say, this is good, uh, you're gonna be all right. And, and maybe in some cases you should say, look, you don't have it. Um, it's not working, you really don't, don't have, it. they never say that though. They just say, by the way, here's your, your you owe your tuition and whatever, and so forth. But um, there are a lot of people who probably should be studying creative writing, or I mean, they don't, they don't or, or a, a lot of uh, colleges teach films, script writing well i mean all the they, when you, uh, you talk to any director in hollywood and he's got 30 scripts that he can't get made so the idea of teaching so you know you're going to be big in the movies i mean i i that i don't get at all but i suppose i don't know maybe it works for some people but what i said in the piece is you need encouragement so um i had i was i was a um pre-med student. My background is in science. And so, you know, chemistry and embryology and I don't know, uh, uh, entomology, all of uh, the, uh, the courses that would get you into medical school, not in literature, although I was a passionate reader. So by re reading, I would say, read and live. Because if you've lived a little, if you get away, go somewhere, join the Peace Corps, Go to Mexico. Go, you know, go somewhere. Have something to write about, because all genuine knowledge comes from direct experience. Chairman Mao said that mm -hmm. <laughs> you need direct experience of the world, and then you have something to write about. You can't sit at home, just you know, spinning your wheels, which is what people are doing now in the pandemic. But I think that's a vexed question. All of these are really interesting questions to me. Um, and I've addressed them, but I've never taught creative writing. And I have, I'm speaking to you from Hawaii. I've lived here more than 30 years. I've never been to the university. I've haven't, I, they have no interest in me. I have very little interest in them. Although I use the library there. Um, is, so, is there, is there a difference between writing novels though and then writing the travel books that you sort of, you know, the genre that you almost gave birth to? Um, I mean, I think, learning to write, I tell my students, I don't, I don't matter what your profession is, being able to explain yourself in a coherent way, um, fluid way is absolutely crucial. Is, is, are those two things different for you, writing travel novels or travel books and writing novels? Different yes, skills. they're different. Uh, the form is different, but the content is sometimes very similar. For example, if you, I started off as a fiction writer, so I wrote uh, uh, I published five works of fiction before I wrote a travel book. I wrote a travel book because I was, I had no ideas. And I knew that if I, if I took a trip, I would be, I, I would be seizing an idea. I would be seizing an experience. I would go out, have the experience, come back and write about it. The helpful thing was if you write novels, you know, Joseph Conrad said, 
what I'm trying to do in my work, I'm paraphrasing, is make you see. What he said was, above all, to make you see. Leonard O'Connor as well, yep. <laughs> yeah, make you see. Um, that's right. So um, I love Flannery O'Connor. I, I, and she had, Flannery O'Connor had a sense of the grotesque, a yes. sense of, of the oddity of, of life, which is very stimulating. If you're young and you read Flannery O'Connor, you think, yes, the world is a crazy place. And this person understands it. It's not, you know, happy families. It's strange stuff. So um, I, I was a very early reader of Flannery O'Connor. And I may be wrong about this, but it seemed to me that at some point I read that Flannery O'Connor used to read tabloids like the, the, um, the National Enquirer or the, these odd, uh, re, she was fascinated by these odd stories. And she read a lot of tabulo, tabloids and, and gutter press thing. Am I wrong about that? I'm not sure that it doesn't, I don't know the, if that is true or not, but it's certainly consistent with her, with her, her persona, right? Um, she was definitely an odd, she, odd person, lived with- And she did, she, she didn't live very long either. I mean, she was, right. she was rather ill, wasn't she? Right. But anyway, so, so you were asking about the, the comparison between both the, the travel book and the novel are both um, works which require imagination. The novel more than the travel book, but you can't write a travel book well if you don't if you don't have the ability to observe, to see a, a tree, a landscape, a face, a human face, um, the texture of a of a of a hillside, of a mountain, of a, a, a the taste of food, the smell of something, all of those are useful in in the novel and in the travel book. The the, the sensory perceptions perceptions. Describing the smell of an onion. If you, you, you do that in, in fiction, but you also should be able to do that in travel. Dialogue, which is essential to the novel, is also very, very helpful in the travel book. How to write dialogue, how to remember dialogue. And I, I don't carry a tape recorder. I've, one of the things that I've trained myself to do is to, to talk to someone for sometimes for an extended period of time and say, thank you, great talking to you, and then go away and write down the conversation to, to commit a, a, um, a, a conversation to memory so that I'm not inhibiting the person by saying, well, then what happened? Because when you, when you're, when you're, well, you seem to be a stenographer, people are very inhibited. And they say, well, I don't know whether I should tell you this. When you, if you're not holding it, you say, well, you know, just between us, what happened? And they say, well, you know, it's a long story, but let me tell you. And you say, well, I like long stories. What is it? And then remembering dialogue. So writing dialogue, describing a landscape, and then it requires a lot of reading. You need to, you need background reading. But the, 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 the experience of writing a novel is you sit down, you write up, you write. I write in longhand, by the way, always. My first draft is always in longhand and I sometimes recopy it. So I sit down, I'm writing, and I get to the end of a chapter and I sometimes think, well, I, I knew what was happening there. A chapter to me is like a short story. It, it has a beginning, middle and end, and it's about something. So I get to the end of a chapter and I think, well, I know the character does this, but you know, what happens next? And I'm kind of often stuck or I'm pondering it for quite a while. I'm, I don't have writer's block, you know, knock on wood. It's not like writer's block. It's just, you're writing a book, what happens then? Then, then what happens? And, and then I, th I think about it, I go for a bike ride or I make a lot of notes and I think with a, with a travel book, you've, I come back from travel book with, with six or eight notebooks with stuff in them. I, so, I'm, I mean, my first book was going by train to you know, London to Tokyo and back on the trans Siberian. So in Pakistan, and I finished Pakistan and then I'm at the border of Wagga, it's called Atari Wagga. Then I go to Amritsar. Well, there it is, turn the page, Amritsar, and, and it's all written out. And I, so I know exactly what's happening. Anyone who's writing a travel book um, should not have writer's block. You just, there it is. All, you've had the experience. You're writing about an experience. You're drawing on something that happened to you. With a novel, your, 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 your novel is a work of the imagination and you're, you're dragging it out of, out of your brain, out of your imagination. 
And sometimes your imagination works and sometimes, you know, it's on pause, but, but either way, uh, it's, it's writing that needs, that you have to have a, the reader over your shoulder and you're thinking, I want someone to experience this, to see it as I'm seeing it. You know, um, th this is why the minimalist writing doesn't move me at all. I mean, there are many minimalist, you know, people who postmodern or modernist uh, writers. Um, Samuel Beckett is one, but he happened to be very good at it. But there are very few people influenced by Samuel Beckett who are doing it, who it works for. That that the the ideal uh, the 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 experience is seeing something. And I'm not, not talking about the naturalistic novel or the realistic novel. I'm just saying you're, you're, you want to persuade the person reading it that it happened, that it's indistinguishable from the truth, that maybe this is a real thing, but, but, but it's there. And the voices have to sound real. Mm -hmm. When I, the first book that really moved me was The Catcher in the Rye, because The Catcher in the Rye is about a, a, a angst-ridden, rather um, uh, 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 accident-prone, teenager who's at a pub who's very unhappy but anyway but ha but as, is a sensitive soul and everything that he thought I thought everything that, that he heard or said I heard or I said I thought well I, I totally get this guy I've reread it. It, it 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 didn't it didn't work when you're older it doesn't work that well when you're young you think this is me this is me and I I, I, I get this so the book uh, my book is about a surfer it's not about surfing although there's surfing in it, but I would like, a, a, anyway, Bill Finnegan, the surfer read it, he gave me a blurb, that, that worked for me, that, that's good. But so the, the difference between travel and, and fiction is not great, that, that you're drawing on the, same, on the same skills, the same gifts that you have to do both. Well, I'll tell you, when I read that paragraph that you read for us, I felt like, oh gosh, I've been in that kind of conversation. That, that's what struck me. That's why I wanted to ask you exactly what you're describing, that it felt so real, uh, all the, the unspoken things that were happening in that, in that moment with that couple. I want to ask another uh, writer, Robert Louis Stevenson, do you agree with him, quote, it's better to travel hopefully than to arrive? That's a... Uh, um... I like that. I mean, I know. In fact, I I I, I use that. I have I have quoted that. And by the way, Robert Louis Stevenson used to live at the at the other side of the side. He was in Honolulu oh. in the eighteen nineties. Circling uh, back all these connections. <laughs> no, no, he had a big connection with Hawaii. He knew the king. He came here, but it didn't work for him. He 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 had um, tuberculosis and um, he had bad lungs. He uh, and he just it, this wasn't the place for him. Although. He was very popular here, and he, um, he the, the king, uh, King Kalakaua was um, a buddy. Uh, I would say that, and then he went to Samoa where he died. To travel, to travel hopefully is better than to arrive. Arrival is always a problem. Uh, so um, it, it's, uh, I would say that traveling hopefully you're in a good mood. Arrival, you think, now what? <laughs> it's, it's like getting into the end of a chapter. You have to uh, begin. But I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a lovely thing to say. Um, and you're kind of, th there's, the bliss of travel is really great. I will say that it's always a problem. Arrival is always a problem. So I had this problem. I mean, I've had it all the time. I, my last book was about Mexico. So I got my car and I drove from Cape Cod, Massachusetts to McAllen, Texas. I went up and down the border. It was great. So when I was, when I was driving, it was wonderful. When I arrived in a place, this is apropos of Robert Louis Stevenson. I always had to figure out, well, where am I gonna stay? Where am I gonna eat? What am I gonna do? When I was in my car, stopping briefly, talking to people, it was great. When I was on the move, when I was actually on the move. When I arrived, a different set of problems arrive, but that's true of all, all travel. And I think, I mean, it's why the, 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 the why movement, just the, 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 uh, the experience of, of travel, of being in motion is so wonderful. But to travel hopefully is, uh, that's, another, that's another question. Do you, um, 
I know that you did a 3,000 mile trip across the country during COVID when you know people are in lockdown. I mean, what are what are your thoughts on how this pandemic uh, has, I don't know how to explain it, but affected our collective consciousness in a way when you talk about the vibrancy of travel and so many of us, most of us, if not all of us, have been uh, sort of cabined in in a way that we never have in our lifetime by necessity. I think it's in a, it may be perverse to say so. I think it's a very salutary thing. It's very hard. A lot of people have died. And so there's a, there's a tragic aspect to it, but it's also a reset for the world. It's shown how global travel caused the spread of the disease that global travel is actually out of control that there are there are countries uh, that are, we we had 10 million tourists in hawaii before the pandemic 10 million tourists is too many here and when the pandemic hit the roads were emptier the beaches were emptier people when people were actually able to go to the beach or drive they realized this is a hawaii that they knew at an earlier time and they liked it uh, no one said oh it's hell i can't go well there's some people thought it's inconvenient i can't visit my children in california or whatever it is but they also thought you know the temperature has gone down that the intensity has gone down and i think that um it, it, it it's it's a way of we're we're removed to an earlier state uh of being where there's just fewer people out and about as far as being confined or cabined, as you put it, I didn't feel that. I, I, can, I can go to the beach. I can get my car. When I was, I spent the summer in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, I drove up to Maine um, most weekends, just to get the car, drive. There was no problem with that. Um, so I didn't feel, you know, I don't live in an apartment in Manhattan. Uh, I, I, I have a, a house and I have a garden, and, you know, and here, same thing. I have a house, I have a garden. So I'm a lucky person, but I, and also I've been locked down most of my writing life. I, mm. You write books by sitting inside writing. Last April, a year, exactly a year ago, I started a novel. I, I started a short story and it became a novel and I'm still working on it. So I don't feel, I don't feel that, but I think also it will make people think about travel do they need to travel? Do we need that many hotels? Do we need that many planes? Do we need to inflict ourselves on foreign countries just to, to go to look at a museum or look at, I don't know, to, to eat a meal? Or as I was on a podcast a little while ago and someone, it was for the BBC and a, and a man in Albuquerque phoned in and said, we have a problem. Uh, we had a work study um, program us, my students were in Bangkok and now we can't go. What do you, when do you think we can open up? How can we do this? I said, you're in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Get in your car, take your students, go to the border. It's very easy. You go to Nogales, for example, or go to the, the border where, where, uh, uh, of New Mexico and, uh, and, and Mexico. And you'll see that simply by crossing the border, walking across the border, go park your car. You don't have to drive across, park your car, walk across. Learn Spanish, do work, study there, talk to people. You'll see that it's a different country. It's a huge country. It's a complex culture. And the, and the, the Mexican border is not as dangerous as people think. So uh, it, I, it hadn't occurred to him you know, that the travel is something you do in Istanbul or Bangkok, it's not something you do next door. The other thing that it will do is familiarize the people, people, Americans with their own country. As you said, I, I drove 3,000 miles from Cape Cod to LA in six days, 500 miles a day. Okay, that's pushing it. But I was alone in the car, listening to music, stopping along the way. I drove in, the, in daylight. It was a wonderful trip. And I saw the country in semi-lockdown. Some places, people wearing masks, other people not wearing masks. Some places, restaurants weren't open. I brought my own food. It was like a huge picnic. I was eating by the side of the road. I was microwaving food in my a motel room. Every motel was empty, so I always had a room, but I mean, that's usually the case. You don't usually have a problem. 
I, it was a great trip. It was a great trip. So I'd say the, the, the tragedy are the deaths, the, the millions who have died, but also it, it, it should acquaint us with a different form that we should find different strategies to get around it. Once we've all been vaccinated, once, once things are back to normal, although they may never be in Central Africa, they may never be in India, I, or it may, be, it may be a long time before that happens. But do you really need to go to India? Why not go to one of the strangest, most impoverished places I've seen in my life, the Delta, the Mississippi Delta? start in, in New Orleans, drive to Memphis up through the Delta, talk to people, or if you want to do some something useful, I don't know, become a teacher there, do something, some, you know, social justice uh, a project or something, or go to South Carolina, which is in the middle of South Carolina is the third poorest county in the United States. It's called Allendale County. I wrote about this in my book, Deep South. Go to Arkansas, the most dysfunctional state I've ever been in. Clinton was governor for almost 12 years. The place doesn't work. There's child poverty, there's child hunger, there's illiteracy, there's hostility, there's racism. You know, well, I mean, that's true in a lot of places, but get acquainted with Arkansas is also a beautiful country, a beautiful state, and has some really friendly people. But, you know, there are, there are issues there, which we don't seem to care about. Why not have an experience of people who are overlooked? So Greensboro, Alabama, which was written about by James Agee, go there now, it's pretty much like it was when James Agee wrote about it in the 1930s. So anyway, the, the uh, pandemic has been horrible, but um, those are my remedies. Well, I, I mean, what's, what strikes me, what you're saying, I, I did a talk to about 80 young women, freshmen and sophomore in college uh, recently, just about you know guidelines for next steps. And there's so much pressure on a lot of these young people to feel like they've got to make the decision now for the rest of their lives. They've got to compete. They've got to, they've got to do the internship. They've got to get the next brass ring. Um, and what I'm hearing you describe is, is that uh, it's the, the wonder and the curiosity of what's around you in the moment, not that kind of pressure. I mean, did you have, did you have big goals in your life early on or were you just sort of paddling down the river? My goal, my first goal was really just to, uh, to get an education and to get away from my family. And I, my fantasies as a schoolboy were foreign places. I, I, I fantasized about going to Africa. I fantasized about going to an exotic location, Siam, Thailand, you know, Bali, India, Mexico. Um, so I, I, that was my, in my mind. When I graduated, I graduated from college in 1963. So we were just getting involved in Vietnam and then uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, I didn't have enough money to go to medical school. I mean, I was really out of money. That's the other thing about a big family to say, you're on your own. My, I'm, my parents said, we wish we could help you, but you're on your own. So I always worked. That's the other thing you do in a big family. You have a job, get a job. You know? So everyone's got a job. So I was self-supporting from the time I left high school. And not because my family were uh, cheating me or anything, but they really had no money. So my dreams were to be independent, to do my own thing, whether it was being a doctor or, or being a writer, but, it, but not to have a board, not to have someone standing over me, an authority figure. I really was anti-authoritarian from a very, very early age. Because I felt I felt I had suffered kind of authoritarianism in my family. I joined the Peace Corps, and but as, but before then I was in Italy. I could speak Italian. I studied Italian in high school, and my grandmother was Italian, so I spoke Italian. So I thought I'll go to Italy. So I had a summer job. I earned money, graduated from college, went to Italy. That was the exoticism that I had. Then naturally I got a job there. I wasn't sightseeing. I got a job teaching in Italy. And when I was in Italy, I got a notification saying, you've been selected to go to Africa to teach at Niasalan. I got, um, I said, okay. I went back to, uh, uh, to Boston and then New York. I joined the Peace Corps and the Peace Corps was the defining thing that happened in my life. It was probably the first great thing that I did, the first useful thing. 
anyone today who's saying I need to get a job, I, I think, I don't know. I mean, I don't get it. I don't get it. You don't really need it. Or if you're going to get a job, get a job in Turkey, get a job in, 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 uh, uh, in Kenya, get a job in India. Uh, you don't really need to climb the corporate ladder. I would say, if, if I had a daughter, I'd say, don't get pregnant, don't get married, don't trust men. They just, you know, just get, get hook up with a girlfriend, or if you, if it's a guy, go with him. But go somewhere, hit the road. But then, but don't be a parasite. Give back, give back to to wherever you are. That was the that was a strategy in the 60s, was leaving. Kennedy said in his inaugural address, he said, um, Ghana needs doctors. You could be doctors, you could go to Ghana and be a doctor. I mean, no president would say that now, but the, 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 he was saying, we can help the world, we can build the world. Part of it was anti-communism. You know, we can, we can um, win the hearts and minds of people to the American way. That was behind a lot of it. But also, if you go to a, play, a new place, a new culture, a new language, learn Swahili, go there. And then, uh, and you'll find out something about the world and you will learn something about yourself. You don't really need to go to New York City and work in web design, you know, I mean, or, I, or anything like that. Study, getting an advanced degree is great, actually. I would say that if, you're, if you don't know what to do, oh yeah, okay, get an MA, get a PhD, fine, great. But you need to have an experience of the world as a worker, as someone giving back, not as a tourist, not as a traveler, not as a vagabond, but someone who's connecting, learning the language. So the first language that I learned in Africa was called Chichewa. I can still speak it. It's spoken in Mozambique, it's spoken in, in Malawi, bits of Zambia. I, I could go there tomorrow and be able to talk to people because in 1963, it was drummed into my brain in Syracuse University. And it's there and there's a cassette still there. So um, that, that was a formative experience for me, the Peace Corps. But it doesn't have to be the Peace Corps. It could be anywhere. You go to the Dominican Republic, work, work doing something useful. And um, it's not a question of that you're, you're going to change people's lives. You're probably not going to change people's lives as a teacher, as a, even as an aid worker. You're not going to change. But you will change your own life. Your, your life will be seriously impacted by and uh, affected by it in a good way. I know we're short on time, That's, um, but I, I wanted to just give you an opportunity, if you would, to weigh in on your book on the Plain of Snakes, A Mexican Journey, where you went to Mexico. And I ask that because, you know, immigration is always a crisis in America, and it's, it's ramping up even more now. It was a big deal with, you know, the Trump policy towards uh, families crossing the border and now we the numbers are just exponentially climbing and we don't America doesn't really seem to have a, a good response um, or plan and I, what would you say having spent time in Mexico are are the one two three big myths that Americans have about that country about those people about about that issue uh, that immigration issue that has captured the country once again. Earlier, we were talking about my novel, Under the Wave at Waimea, and I said I got to a certain point in the novel and was pondering it. And around the same time, uh, the president began, Trump made a lot of xenophobic statements against Mexicans. And I thought, what I'm going to do now is something I've done various times in my life. I mean, I'm going to go to Mexico and put my novel aside and go to Mexico and write about Mexico. And then when I, and I did that, I, I, I bought a car, I drove to Mexico, I drove up and down the border, I came back, I wrote the book on the plane of snakes about Mexico, my experiences. And then two years roughly after I put my novel away, I resumed writing the novel, then I finished the novel. So in the middle of the novel, I went to Mexico. What are the myths you ask? The main myth is that, that um, that immigration is about Mexicans. It's not about Mexicans. Me Mexicans crossing the border are, are, have diminished in number vastly over the years. The, the, so the number of uh, Mexicans crossing the border is far fewer than other people. And who are the other people? Well, they're people from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. 
countries that are traumatized by gang violence, poverty, bad government, and also uh, aid that has been withdrawn from them. So these people are really don't have any feel they have any future in Central America. So they're coming and they're coming in large numbers and they come through Mexico. In my book, I went to several shelters on the border and then and then in Huchitan. In Huchitan, they, they come and there are, there are centers where they, they, um, they're able to stop. They're, they're run by Catholic charities actually. And they're, they're kind of, they think, you know, giving your poor, giving your weak and they're fed and they, 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 they work in Huchitan and then they move on and they take a train called La Bestia, La Bestia, the, the beast, this bad train. They load on, they try to get to the border and get across. But so, those, so there's Mexicans falling in number. The idea that Mexicans are coming to the States to, to rape and murder is also wrong. Mexicans come to work. They, they come to work, to make money, to send the money back. And many of them go back. And there was a time when the border wasn't um, a, 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 a solid line. Mexicans used to come back and forth, come to the States, work, and then go back and go back and forth. When, when Clinton had Operation Gatekeeper, and I think it was 1994, they solidified the border and then Mexicans who came across realized they, they couldn't go, they couldn't cross back again. And so they became illegal immigrants. But my ancestors came, my have a French name. They came from Quebec and Canada. They routinely, Cross the border. My grandfather never recognized. My grandfather first couldn't read or write. He worked in a in a mill in in Nashua, New Hampshire, and his idea was, um, I'll go make some money, then go back to his town, Yamaska, and 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 support his family. And it, there was no border. It was just a place you you cross back and forth. That's what the Mexicans are. There's a category of immigrants called special interest aliens, Syrians. Chinese, Congolese, Nigerians, Iraqis, other people, not, not, the, not Hispanic people, uh, but they're not coming to fix your roof. And a lot of them have money. So they come legally, they, they go through tunnels. So uh, it's, it's often the case that you find 50 or 60 Chinese nationals apprehended at a tunnel. Each of them paid a lot of money to go uh, to, to pay a coyote to take them over the border. Who are they? Are they coming to fix your roof? No. Are they coming to pick lettuce in Yuma, Arizona? No. They're coming because they're escaping, I don't know, Chinese repression. And they have money. It's the same in, in Africa. So, so people from all over Angola, uh, they come, they, go, they fly to Ecuador, they go to Mexico, they get to the border, and they end up in Portland, Maine. It, which is the case, actually. What do I think about the border? I think we need a border. I do think we need a border. We need a, a secure border. We also need uh, um, to apprehend people who are uh, sneaking across and examine and say, why are you here? Oh, sir, I come from India. I'm escaping repression. Oh, really? Well, India is a democratic country. True, it has a caste system, which is cruel to some people, and, it, and there's a lot of poverty there, but really, um, I, I, are you trying to get political asylum from uh, uh, Mr. Modi's India? Political asylum from it? I would examine that and I would say, well, what exactly are, you know, how are you oppressed? So the, the, the jails in Florence, Arizona and other are full of Indians, Pakistanis <laughs> and other Chinese and other people. They're not full of Mexicans. That's so uh, it's, it's a complex it's a complex situation. One of the problems is our, our very bad relations with Mexico. If we had really great relations with Mexico, which deteriorated in the Trump administration, we would have border protection and it would have some kind of understanding of what a border is. And their southern border, they have a problem on this southern border. Is. So I'm not for open borders. But when you go to the board, in my, it's in my book. I, I interviewed all these people in, on the plane of snakes. I discovered in the book, Mexicans are, are great people. There's great culture, there's great writing. There's, I met writers, composers, poets, painters, revolutionaries. I, I had a wonderful experience there. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful country. I would go back there any time. It's not a Mex the, the immigration problem, isn't it? It's not, a, it's not Mexico, it's the world. 
It's the world. And it's someone in... Uh, Wulamuchi. Wulamuchi is in Western China. It's in Xinjiang. There are a lot of... The Uyghur people are in Xinjiang. So that guy, that woman in Wulamuchi is saying, Xi Jinping is oppressing us. I want to get out of here. Where can I go? If that guy or that woman could get to Mexico and cross the border, he would do it in a heartbeat. And probably there are Uyghurs trying to get across the border. Is that because, um, I, I mean, how do we solve that problem? I, I mean, I don't know. Right. Get, maybe get um, Tim Cook to stop funding <laughs> Apple in, in China and maybe doing stuff here. In other words, other countries need to be stimulated to, to develop some sensitivity and uh, I don't know. And, as the world has shrunken and globalism has taken hold, everyone's looking for cheap labor. And everyone, and when I was in the Peace Corps, this is a valuable lesson. I used to say to my class, what do you want to do? I want to be in Poland. I want to be a teacher. I'd like to be a doctor. I want to help the country. They want to stay and help the country. If you go to any country in the world, practically, and go to a classroom, the kind of classroom I, I, I was in, when I was 22, 23 years old, and you say, so what would you like to do? All of them would say, I want to go to America. I want to leave this country. I want to leave. not, I want to be a teacher. I want to be a doctor. Or maybe I want to be a nurse so that I can go help uh, the National Health Service in, in the UK. That's because the UK hires people from all over India and Africa. No one wants to stay. We, we are a, a magnet for the world's dreams. And... That's a problem because if, they, if you can't get here legally, then you'll try to sneak across the border. But each, these are human beings, they're individuals, everyone has a story. And I think in some way we need to understand what is, what is your story? Are you just a rich Chinese guy who paid a coyote to come across? Or are you a seriously oppressed person from wherever who needs asylum? So, yeah, well, it's back to story. I mean, it makes me also think of the 560,000 deaths. There's a story behind each of those. There's a story uh, behind all of the people you're describing. I think it's uh, absolutely fascinating. We come back to storytelling. And I have so many more questions in particular, which is your favorite? Because I'm a, I'm a music buff. So I, I wrote a few down from one of your interviews. Ramblin' Man, Allman Brothers, Against the Wind, Bob Seger, or on the road again, Willie Nelson, which would you, if you had to pick, Paul? <laughs> I think on the road again, but I'll tell you something on the road. When I drove from recently, my cross country trip, anti-pandemic trip, I did wear a mask by the way. Um, I listened to Philip Glass and Philip Glass, do you know Philip Glass? Minimalist music, great, he's a, a great composer. He's in his eighties now, uh, if you heard, some of his music, it's very trance-like music. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like what a, what a young person would say, house music or, or I, I don't know. But it's, it's, it it's modern, modern classical music. So I listen to that. You can listen to Willie Nelson, maybe for 10 or 15 minutes, but, but if you're on a 500 mile trip, you need something a little more soothing. Well, with that, Philip Glass, uh, I want to thank you, Paul Through. It's been really an honor and a pleasure to have this conversation. So thank you for taking the time on Simple Politics to talk about your work, uh, not only writing, but also travel. It's such a fascinating life. Thank you very much, Kim. The books are, so Deep South, on the Plain of Snakes about Mexico. Deep South is this rambling around the South, on the Plain of Snakes. And the new book is Under the Wave at Waimea, a novel about a aging surfer with a problem sounds wonderful thanks very much that one i've seen i'm gonna get i'm gonna pick up that one one on the south for sure and the one on the family you mentioned deep deep yeah. south deep yeah. south one of the best trips i've taken in my life the south was like a foreign country a, a, a great foreign country yeah well that's we'll, we'll leave it at that thank you again enjoy the okay. wave <laughs> thank you bye for now bye now Gerard, you got it? Can I sign off?